Hello, and welcome to the webinar, The Waiting Game, Understanding Polling Place Lines and Preparing for 2020. Today's presentation is part of a series of webinars brought to you by the Certificate in Election Administration Program at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. My name is Lee Chittenden. I'm with the program here at the Humphrey School and want to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I have a couple housekeeping items to go over. First, we are recording the webinar and we'll be sending out a link to the recording once we are finished. Um, and also, during the presentation, we will have two Q&A sessions where you'll be able to submit questions to the panelists. In order to ask a question, quick, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar screen highlighted here by the red circle. This will open a Q&A dialog box where you can type and submit your question. We will be monitoring questions and we'll get through as many as we can. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Tammy Patrick and Matthew Weil. Tammy is a senior advisor to the elections program at the Democracy Fund, a bipartisan foundation working to ensure that our political system is able to withstand new challenges and deliver on its promise to the American people. Focusing on modern elections, Tammy helps lead the Democracy Fund's efforts to foster a voter-centric election system and work to provide election officials across the country with the tools and knowledge they need to best serve their voters. In May of 2013, she was selected by President Obama to serve as a commissioner on the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, which led to a position at the Bipartisan Policy Center to further the work of the PCEA. Prior to that, she was the Federal Compliance Officer for Maricopa County Elections Department for 11 years. Tammy was tasked with serving more than 2 million registered voters in the greater Phoenix Valley. She collaborates with community and political organizations to create a productive working relationship with the goal of voter participation and efficient election administration. Tammy also serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School in the Certificate Program of Election Administration Program. Joining Tammy today is Matthew Weil. Matthew is director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Elections Project. Prior to joining BPC in February of 2013, he worked at the Department of the Treasury on domestic finance issues in the Office of Public Affairs. Previously, he served as a research and policy analyst at the US Election Assistance Commission, working on National Voter Registration Act regulations, drafting congressionally mandated reports, and directing the Election Management Guidelines Program. He also served as a staff member on the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project. While graduated from John Hopkins University with a master's in government analytics, he also earned a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Pennsylvania. And now I will turn it over to Tammy to start us off. Wonderful, thanks so much, Lee. Um, it's great to have everyone here joining us today. Um, it's sort of like coffee talk with Tammy and Matt. Um, it's great <laughs> to have my, my former colleague here joining us. Um, what we really wanted to focus on today is what we've titled here the waiting game, understanding polling place lines and preparing for 2020. We've broken this up into a couple of sections. The first I wanted to do a little bit of a history behind line data collection and in fact the impact of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. What we saw in the 2012 election was that there were very long lines. I often say that we don't always know what the story of an election is going to be until after the election. But the story of 2012 was definitely long lines. We had voters waiting in line in some areas of the country upwards of six, seven, eight hours. And that's where very historically then um, uh, President Obama said that we needed to fix it. And in the um, State of the Union address in 2013, he uh, said very um, astutely that he was going to go ahead and name a nonpartisan commission to improve the voting experience in America. And that's when the Presidential Commission on Election Administration was formed. Um, we had the good fortune of having state election officials, local election officials, um, the bright line managers from Disney and other parts of industry to help inform our efforts. One of the things that we found, however, was that there was a lack of line data collection being done around this 
country. There really wasn't um, a, a, an academic repository that we would be able to draw upon to know how long voters really were um, waiting. And so that's where in the, the report that we issued in January of 2014, we concluded a couple of things. One, that as a general rule, no voter should have to wait for more than half an hour um, in order to have the opportunity to vote. And we also recommended that there be improved data collection um, for the purpose of improving the voting experience. And so after the Presidential Commission on Election Administration um, uh, issued our report, what we then had uh, was a, a partnership that was forged at the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, and along with also um, uh, MIT and some other academics to really study lines. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Matt um, to give us a little bit of an, of an insight into that effort. Sure. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, thank you for having me today. I appreciate joining Tammy and again, my former colleague and Really, it's been a bucket list item for me for a long time to share a PowerPoint with Tammy, so I'm glad to do that today. <laughs> um, as Tammy mentioned, um, you know, the BPC, Bipartisan Policy Center, was involved when the, the PCEA was doing its work. Um, and you know, famously, the, the two co-chairs, Bob Bauer and Ben Ginsburg, they looked to Nate Persley, who was the research director of that program, and, and asked, okay, well, bring me uh, the evidence of where the lines are. And, you know, the fact of the matter is there is no real good um, evidence at the, the local level, at the precinct level about where lines are. And we need that kind of um, data uh, to, to make actionable policy decisions. So what we did was the Bipartisan Policy Center joined with MIT to create a nationwide program that collects data in a very simple way. So on this slide that I created, I really created it for three reasons. One was because I, I want to make sure that everyone knows that MIT and Charles Stewart is a very important partner in this program. And while I'm here talking today with Tammy, that's because I'm in DC. And Charles is also uh, an excellent um, person to talk to about, about lines. Uh, number two was because I want to show you a picture of myself. I didn't realize it was going to be on the first screen. And number three is because I wanted a slide to exist where I am on the same slide as Charles Stewart. So that, those are the three reasons why I've done that. It's a noble, it's a noble aspiration. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> uh, so who we are. So we, our goal really is to figure out a way to provide local election jurisdictions with actionable data about the lines that formed at the polling places, usually on election day. We know there are a lot of other groups and academic institutions that are, are trying to collect lines and there are a lot of ways to do that. Ours, we tried to do very simply and we wanted to make it simple because we knew we needed the poll workers to do it. Uh, that's how we were going to get the best coverage. We couldn't have researchers at every single polling place that we were going to work at. That was going to be cost prohibitive. So we needed to find a way that we thought the poll workers wouldn't rebel against doing it, and we can get uh, consistent data across many jurisdictions that run elections in very different ways. So the easiest way to do that, we thought, was on paper. And we have a, a tally sheet that really just requires the poll worker to count the number of people in line at the top of every hour. They write that number down and they record the number of check-in stations they have available at that hour. If it's EPDs, electronic poll books, you know, that, that's what they're counting. If it's the paper, uh, paper poll book, that's what they're counting. If they do this every hour and we have the throughput for the day of how many people are actually using the services of that polling place, we can use some math to get uh, average lines for the entire day. Some of our more advanced program participants also provided us with their EPD data. So we were able to get hourly average wait times little more uh, granular data, probably, probably a little more useful as well. And I, we're going to dig into mm -hmm. um, some of those strategies um, as well in a second here of, of what the different counties and jurisdictions were able to provide. So let's, let's just take one step back and talk a little bit about the different strategies. So um, we have the strategy when you're talking about lines and people waiting of looking at the time that people are waiting and also the number, the counting, as it were, um, of people. Um, another way of looking at this is, do you present the information in real time? So having a dashboard for an early voting center um, or a vote center on election day, or is this data that you collect to use the next time or for the next election? These are decision points that you need to make. And we also recognized that 
there are very different opinions, both in the voters' acceptance of, of having to wait or standing in a line during early voting and on election day. During early voting, um, there are almost always long lines in the final days and hours of early voting. But my um, experience has been that voters aren't as upset then because they usually understand that they had you know, two weeks or a month or 45 days and they procrastinated a little bit. And so they, they got there with the bulk of, of other individuals. That's not always the case on election day. On election day, um, people are not as forgiving um, when they in fact have to only go to one place um, during a set number of hours on a single day. One of the things that's important when you're thinking about contemplating this kind of data collection is really thinking about this in, um, in an operations perspective and the whole ecosystem. So when I was uh, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, we started on this project. And one of the things that we did when we were out observing is we would diagram a polling place. So you see a polling place here and it shows you the doorway coming in at the top of the screen. Uh, there's a check-in table and then they kind of go around some of the tables to another um, computer and that's where they get their ballot and then they go around to another place. You can see by the arrows being drawn of the flow of voters that if you have any number of voters in this polling location, it's going to get congested, there's going to be confusion. Um, and that's the sort of thing you need to identify when you're doing this. So one, yes, it's absolutely collecting the number and the data, but it's also about taking a snapshot of what's occurring in the polling place on that time. So this is a, a snapshot of um, one of the data collections that we did and we really recorded the voters in the process at each of these various stages so that we could get an idea about how long it was taking. So in that last picture you saw that I was doing it on paper, um, there are also um, different applications that are available for individuals who want to do this. So the Center for Technology and Civic Life has an app that's available out on their electiontools.org toolkit and it allows you as, um, as a jurisdiction to monitor and get an idea of how long it's taking voters to go through your flow so that you can um, allocate your resources uh, you know, accordingly. Now, one thing to think about here is when are you gonna do this? You need to have that information well in advance. One way of gathering the information is at your poll worker training classes. So set up a mock polling place, have them walk through what a process would be for a voter, and that's one of the ways in which you can gather some of that data um, to make sure before election day that you're fully covered. It's also one of the advantages to doing kind of a timing element here, at least by breaking it up into the segments, is that you get an idea of where your bottlenecks are. So this um, was some information that we gathered when we were in Virginia looking at their um, in-person absentee process. And it became very evident that at the time they had 19 reasons or excuses that needed to be provided. That was the longest amount of time in the entire process was four and a half minutes, more than four and a half minutes on average, that it was taking people to fill out their applications. Um, that was more time than the time combined waiting in line, checking in at, at the registration, getting their ballot printed, getting their ballot you know, handed to them, voting their ballot and casting their ballot. So it allows you as well to find out why you might be having some of these bottlenecks in the process. So this is the fun part. We've already uh, mentioned Charles Stewart at MIT. And um, I'm not going to go super in depth into que queuing theory for a variety of reasons, mostly because um, look at that slide. Um, but here's the overall genesis of this. And the, the most important things to remember is that, and this ties to um, Matt's point about the counting. So queuing theory in Little's Law tells us that we can understand the long-term average of the length of a line if we understand the arrival rate, which is the long-term um, arrival patterns, and then also the average wait time. So this is the standard Little's Law algorithm. But what Charles and the good crew at MIT have done have rearranged it in a way that we can gather what we need, even though we only have one piece of data to start off with. And that is the long-term arrival rate. How many voters voted at that polling place on that day? So if you know that at the end of the day, and then you count, as Matt mentioned, the number of people in line at the top of every hour, you can get your average wait time over the day. 
So let's take a look at what that means. In this example, um, for um, I think we called it Franconia precinct, um, if 1,450 people arrived during the 13 hour voting day, and we had down that there were two electronic poll books at the top of each hour, there were 22, 10, 12, nobody standing in line, um, et cetera, we find out that the wait time was a little under seven minutes. So that's how the math works behind um, gathering what the average wait time is, even though you're only counting the voters in line at the top of the hour. Um, that project also laid out some very helpful diagrams um, as to which voters do you count at the top of every hour. And what we found is that um, many jurisdictions said, you know what, it's fine for the wait that you know, people have to check in, but we also see queues forming in the secondary phase, and that's either where they're waiting for the voting booths or um, the direct recording device or at the tabulation. We want to know, you know, how many of those instances we need um, to have as well. So the um, program adopted to that as well. So you can either do one or two. So basically by taking the number of total arrivals over the course of the day, you get that average wait time. And as Matt mentioned, when you couple that with your electronic poll book data, it gives you some really, really robust information. So what we saw, the jurisdictions that participated in this is, first of all, um, most of them didn't hire somebody else to do it. They had whoever was their line walker or their greeter or a student poll worker or the most one of the most important roles at the polling place, the sticker hander outerer which is um, a technical term, um, be the person that counted at the top of every hour. Um, some of them provided that data collection sheet just to all of their jurisdictions um, with a very informal training. And they then used that information to inform where they needed resources to tell their story to the media and funding sources of why they needed additional um, materials. They reviewed trends um, in individual precincts to set the expectations for field rovers to say things like, you know what, you're going to want to start your day at this precinct because they always um, tend to have a long line then. And um, they also used it to the trends to inform when poll workers take their breaks or change shifts, rotate positions, that sort of thing as applicable. So that's kind of the background of what the project was and how election officials used it. Um, but then we had some, some wonderful formal reports that came out from the Bipartisan Policy Center of what the program showed at a national level. So I'd love, Matt, if you um, don't mind walking us through um, what those two reports were and, um, and what we learned. Sure. So thank you, Tammy. We, we've done this uh, in, a, in a national way two times, one for the 2016 election, one for the 2018 election. We did a much smaller pilot in 2014, but hard to generalize from, from the very small survey we did then. Uh, in 2016, we had 11 states uh, and participating, uh, included 4,006 precincts. We had 56,000 hourly records. Obviously, this was a presidential election. Uh, it was the first presidential election after the PCA, so we, we had a lot of concern over whether long lines would, were going to be a, a concern again. Um, and again, what we've learned is, for the most part, most people are not waiting in huge long lines for, throughout the day. Um, I know that's the perception of the media. The media is very good at finding the long lines. They get a camera on it immediately. But what we're seeing is about 6% of precincts in our study, and this was a, a convenient study, so we can't necessarily generalize the entire uh, country, although our sample is actually pretty good um, when, you, when you break it down demographically. Only 6% of the precincts were waiting over 30 minutes to vote in the 2016 election. Other, th other things that we learned that were a little bit unusual findings, or at least unexpected findings, you know, there has long been the belief that voters come early, there's a lull, and then they come back at the end of the day. That didn't happen in 2016. Um, it was very skewed to the, the morning hours. Um, another finding that was very interesting from this report uh, was that if you were able to clear very long lines in the first two to three hours after opening, you were very unlikely to have them again later in the day. Uh, this was something relatively new that we hadn't realized that before. If you can't clear it after three hours, you're in trouble at an individual polling place. Um, so this is information that you know, local election officials, administrators can use to identify places that are having problems on election day, even though we're not doing real time sharing of, of wait times, but election officials can, can certainly gather this information. If they're seeing long lines, they should be 
figuring out ways to um, mitigate those issues at those polling places. Yeah, it sounds like um, one of the things that would be helpful then is in training classes, in poll worker training classes, board worker training classes, central workers, judges, whatever your vernacular is locally, is to set that expectation with the workers that if they show up to open the polls half an hour before they open and you have, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred people already standing in line, you need to call in because that's gonna be something that's gonna be hard to clear. That's, that's exactly right. Our 2018 survey, now it's not exactly, it's not the same 11 states, um, but about the same number of participants. And you know, the, the findings there were, were very similar, but um, we were able to do a few few more things. So uh, 2016, the average wait time was a little over 10 minutes. In 2018, the average wait time was just under nine minutes. Again, that's well within the acceptable limit of PCA, which was no one should be waiting more than 30 minutes to vote. Uh, the bad news again, about the same number of precincts averaged a greater than 30 minute wait on election day, 5% uh, in this case. 1.5% uh, of precincts did average over an hour wait, which was three times larger than what happened in 2016. Um, so certainly identifying those issues uh, is, is important. And I have a little bit of a, you know, a figure here showing the distribution uh, of the average wait times of our, our participa participating um, precincts. If, uh, if I could interject sure. on one thing on that last slide, I think that what, um, what this shows is the inverse elbow of death. So we can't talk about lines or have a, a, a presentation about lines and not bring that up because I think it's, it's really important. And what the elbow of death is, is if, as you look at this, um, is if you are going along, voters are coming at a steady pace, you're processing them at a steady pace and everything is fine. Once you get to a point where too, vote, too many voters are coming um, too quickly for you to process them and the amount of time it takes you to process them, that's when you get into that situation where you can't catch up and you'll just fall further and further behind. So this is kind of the inverse elbow of death in that they started out with too many people to process at the beginning of the day and could just quite simply never recover. Right, and that's important because we know that from 2014 to 2018, based on uh, CCES survey data, there was a 38% uh, increase in, in turnout. Actually, that, that, that Sorry, that data point is from the EVE survey, but we know that um, there was a 38% uh, increase in turnout from over, in those four year periods over those like elections. You know, the difference though is that there was a wide variability in states. You know, Utah was at like 70% um, election over election. Alaska and Louisiana saw almost no change from 2018 to 2014. Some states though that had very, very large turnout increases um, didn't necessarily see much longer lines. You'd expect there to be some correlation between more turnout, longer line. And there is some, it's just not very strong. So New Jersey, Virginia had very big increases in um, turnout election over election, but actually had decreases in their lines. They were likely not near their elbow of death in 2014. So they had a little more capacity gotcha. um, in 2018. Some jurisdictions with, with somewhat similar increases, like Georgia, Nevada, uh, South Carolina, very similar increases to Virginia and New Jersey, or maybe even slightly smaller increases, their average lines uh, went up considerably. So they were probably in 2014 very near their elbows of death uh, and exceeded the, their capacity of those polling places in 2018. Gotcha. And that's where knowing what that tipping point is, that's why that is so important. Another finding that we weren't able to do in, in 2016 in that, in that national survey was to overlay some demographic data onto it. I mean, I, I do think that um, there's a lot of interest in, in where lines are happening. And you know, certainly 5% of polling places exceeding the service standard of 30 minutes isn't horrible nationwide, but we know that it's also not um, equally spread across the country. It's impacting different voters in different ways. So, one of our findings uh, is that in precincts with 10% or less minority voters, the average wait time was 5.1 minutes. But in precincts with 90% or more minority voters, the average wait time climbed to 32.4 minutes. Uh, and this, as you can see from the chart, um, goes up very, very rapidly at the very end. You know, certainly as um, polling places move from less minority to more minority, the wait time goes up. But even when we're seeing 60 to 70%, it's not 
a, a huge increase. The increase is at the very, very high percentages of minorities in the precinct. Uh, then we're seeing very long wait times. Why is that, Matt? What What can you? I know that you have limited data on yeah. on this, but um, what is your kind of general notion from the information that you've gathered of where these polling places are, um, and and also the types of voting options voters have in those states and in those jurisdictions? Is it the case that they um, have limited options in early voting and voting by mail, and so they are most likely to have to go to um, a polling place on Tuesday, or is it? You know, what do we have any notion as to why? this is the case. So we saw correlations like this um, for precincts that had more minorities, that, that precincts had more renters, and that and then precincts that um, were lower income. A lot of this is also correlated with the level of urban density. Uh, Does so, it? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know exactly. We didn't really see anything consistently um, across states that had more absentee voting or um, early voting. We didn't really see that. So I, I think there's a, a question. And one of the hypotheses we have out there would be, at least for the renters, more turnover in, in the, the precinct probably, people less likely to be aware of the voting system. We know voters vote more slowly on voting systems with which they're unaware. So that could be part of why there's more lines. You know, lower income, most likely to have lower resources for the polling places. Yeah, Any I've, of these things yeah. can be correlated with it. It's, we, don't, we need more information, yeah. but right now we do know that if you are you know, administering an election in a jurisdiction that has some of these precincts that have very high percentages of minority voters, you want to be wary of, of some long lines that could occur there. I'm also wondering when you mentioned renters and, and some of these other things, that to me immediately says provisional ballots potentially. If there isn't um, you know, automated, automated voter registration or the situations in place to move those voters um, when, they, when they move. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this at the very beginning, but um, one of the findings we had in 2016, it carried through for, for 2018, is that lines are, are by far the longest at the beginning of the day. 69% of the precincts in our study were experiencing their lines, their longest lines within the first hour. One thing that did occur in, in 2018, that we didn't see in 2016, was a little bit more of a bump at the end of the day. Um, you know, I think we hypothesized that that could be the electorate is a little different during midterm versus a, a presidential, um, but it was it was pronounced and it, it was across the states too. It was not just um, being swayed by one or two states. So uh, that's something to be aware of certainly for future midterm elections. I know we're going into a presidential, so we want, might want to look back at 2016 as the more relevant uh, finding. Great. Well, and as we mentioned, you know, it's quite possible that when you get there in the morning, there are already voters. Yeah. I, I remember one election. Um, I had voters telling me that they had started getting in line at three o'clock in the morning and the polls opened, you know, at, at six. Um, and so that's, that's hard to recover from, but when there's enthusiasm, and we're going to talk a little bit about enthusiasm, um, that that's, that can be the case. Yeah, I mean, famously in, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia um, area, the, I, I go back to 2008 when I was a poll worker during the primaries and we had an ice storm. Uh, during the primaries, they hit kind of in the middle of the day, and I was working as a poll worker, and a lot of people couldn't get to the polls at the end of the day. So I feel like people just have shifted to making sure I get it out of the way before the rest of the day happens, and and just and do it that way. It's, it's done. Well, I like that you also have some um, overviews yes. and some gen some general takeaways from the reports. Right. So this is this is uh, a key thing for us. I I think that there are a lot of good surveys out there. I mentioned CCS earlier. It gives some wait times. The reason why our, our study is a little different is that we're really aiming to give the local administrator actionable data to improve the voting experience in their precincts. Um, you know, I, I do hear a lot of pushback when we try to get new jurisdictions to sign on to this. We don't have any, any polling place lines. We don't need to do this. Um, and if I'm able to get through that and we do the study, sometimes we find lines that they didn't expect because Generally, poll workers are a little bit quiet about problems they're having on election day if they're, if they're not specifically asked. Um, and, and these things can be studied and brought under control if we have the data. That was one major finding that we've had over the past two years. Um, to do any kind of actionable data or to get evidence on actionable data, you need to do the, uh, the data collection at every polling place. Um, that, that's really the key. You don't know what you don't know. Right. We, we certainly had some jurisdictions that were interested in doing it at a couple places. 
uh, what we've estimated when we've, we've been out there observing some of our data collections, it takes the poll workers a minute or two minutes, even to count the longest lines you're experiencing. Sure, if it's around the block, that's going to be a different, unusual experience. But for the most part, to even count 100 people online is a minute or two minute endeavor. Most polling places have the capacity to do that. And, and it really does benefit not just the jurisdictions, but our overall knowledge of, of election day lines. Um, certain uh, best practice management techniques and policies that encourage a smooth flow of voters in polling places can reduce long lines. Tammy mentioned that before. The layout, the size of the polling places, how many voters are assigned to the, poll, the, the polling place itself, how many machines are there. All of these are resource allocation tools that certainly can help um, with uh, controlling longer lines. Okay. Oh, went too far. There we go. Uh, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, one of the, the key things that I, I try to make clear anytime I speak about our, our lines report is that the, the, the vast majority of voters are not experiencing long lines on election day. That is not the norm. Um, but even if we think that it's only 5% of, of precincts, that, that's numbers in the millions of voters. And so that is, that is millions of voters that are having a, a voting experience that you know, a pretty high level presidential commission has said is, is, too, is, is too long to wait. Um, I think we could just read these, that whether it's issues that are unique to the polling places or more general problems related to chronic capacity shortages, both can cause long lines. So long lines can be caused by many things. Uh, it could be how long it takes to, to uh, vote the ballot. Certainly Florida is aware that long ballots have, have consequences, but it could be many other issues. Yep, absolutely. Um, and that's something we're going to talk about in a second is the, um, the, the way in which we can can figure out our resources. Um, so before we transition into that portion um, of the session, we want to open it up for Q&A on this beginning piece. And if it's something that we're going to talk about in the second section, um, I may go ahead and defer. Um, so um, let me see if I can get to where the Q&A is. Or Lee, if you have if you have some, a question that you could read, it's, I'm not yep, I can it. I can read one. Um, awesome, thank you. Were there any vote center jurisdictions in the study? And um, if so, do wait times change for vote center elections versus traditional polling place elections? I'd have to go back through some of the data that we have. I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. The vast majority of our participants were traditional polling places, uh, not vote centers, where people didn't have options. Um, when I mentioned earlier that, you know, this is, Tammy mentioned the, the different considerations that administrators have to um, wrestle with when deciding how to do data collection. Ours is never going to be a real-time program where you can use our data, plug it into a, an algorithm and, and spit back out a, a live wait time, which would be helpful for places that have, have vote centers where people have options. But the ma majority of our, our, our jurisdictions are Michigan, Virginia, Florida, where we're not seeing vote centers being uh, used so heavily yet. Yeah, and I think that there were a handful that were also interested in gathering the data during early voting, mm -hmm. even for those that weren't using vote centers per se. Um, and so there were some, but I don't think that, I think they were doing that more for their own yeah. edification than part of this greater project, at least in the first year. Right, <laughs> yeah, no, and we've only had a couple of, a handful of jurisdictions give us data on early voting, so we, we haven't really uh, used it, um, analyzed it so specifically yet because it, it would be very skewed towards the jurisdictions that participated. Great, okay, we have another one here. Um, for the tally sheets, how did you do quality control on the data you received? How did you do data entry and process those 56,000? Yes, so that is where I lean heavily on MIT and their expertise. So they, um, they have some graduate students that, as you know, are, are um, always looking to help with um, professors' work. And so Charles Stewart has a, a whole group of uh, graduate students and they did some data entry and they ran some analyses on, um, well, if they participated in 2018, 2016, they compared some numbers to make sure that things were right. Um, and, and he has some algorithms to, to check that too. One of the, the biggest differences between 2016, 2018 was we were much, we brought a, jurisdictions much more information about how to do the tally sheets. We were a little bit, um, I guess, lax on, on what we said to them at the, the first time. It was more refined was more as refined, the process yes. went along. Well, we, what we realized, because we weren't talking to people who handle data all the time, they put they didn't, sometimes didn't put anything if there were no people in lines. 
and when, when doing data, a zero and a nothing in there is a big difference. And so that was an issue where we, we actually had to throw out a lot of the um, precincts because we didn't have enough uh, hourly check-in uh, data points. So we, we also have a limit, we, we have a requirement that any precinct that gets analyzed as part of our, our study uh, needed 11 uh, hourly check-ins at least uh, to, be, to be included so that we knew we had a pretty good um, capture of the entire day. Great. Okay, um, do you see any differences in wait times for communities with different voting technologies and what's the impact of election day slash same day registration? So we haven't, well, first of all, there haven't been that many um, in the jurisdictions that we have, um, that many changes, um, at least from 2016, 2018. Uh, a little hard for us to gather all that data as well. So, and again, as we start cutting this a little more finely, it's hard to do. Um, and we, we haven't done the analysis on election day registration because again, some jurisdictions are doing it very differently. I, yeah, I, th I think um, one thing to consider when you talk about election day registration and also provisional voting or provisional balloting, which is, um, you know, an additional process. Uh, when we showed that slide of which voters are counted, if you are a jurisdiction where you keep everyone in one monolithic line, even if they are a new person to register or there's a, a, some sort of a problem with the registration, it's going to be a provisional ballot. Um, the most efficient thing is to, even though it may seem, even if you're using an electronic poll book, like it's only going to take a few more seconds to get that person totally processed. Those couple of seconds, which we'll see in a minute here when we go through some of the resource allocation tools, can make all the difference between a 20 minute wait and an hour long wait. So really any of the, um, you wanna streamline the voting process so that those voters who need additional help get that additional attention in, an, in another line um, because that's gonna keep your main line flowing more quickly and more smoothly. And I'll just add to that, that for the purposes of our study, we were really, really focused on the, the check-in. I know that in the past we've tried to figure out ways to to get data on more points of the process. Um, we just, when we made it more complicated, we got less good data collection. Uh, and so for 2018, we're really very specific. We only, we only did data at the um, check-in station, not at the tabulator, not at the, the DRE if that's what they had. So it's, it's hard to know um, if that would have impacted the lines, but I don't think that was what was causing the lines in those cases. Great, we're gonna do one more question now and then we'll have more um, at the second Q&A. So um, can civil society organizations help election authorities monitor and study the lines at polling places or does your model rely solely on election administrator monitor monitoring? Now, our program uh, relies solely on poll workers right now, um, but there are a lot of other programs, including others that MIT is a part of that rely on um, nonprofits and educational institutions. So certainly there are options and they're, they're all slightly different. Tammy put up a slide earlier of, you know, an earlier project that we had that was really doing a lot more timing within the polling place of individual voters. Um, and that yields extraordinarily rich data that is very useful. It's just very hard to do. Um, so it just requires a little more um, coordination between uh, the election jurisdiction, the organizations, the institutions, but I do know that Charles Stewart and um, many other um, professors from around the country are going to be doing a, a much larger study in 2020. And I'm sure they're going to be looking for any partners they can find because they want to make it as large as possible. Yeah, so one thing there, and this is the perfect you know, segue because we are on uh, the University of Minnesota's um, Humphrey School webinar, um, is really that academic um, and practitioner and public partnership with both voters and, and groups that are concerned about the process. Um, it really is a great way for everyone to partner together um, in order to make sure that everyone is well served. So let's transition to 2020, um, which will be here in a matter of days. Um, just to get your heart palpitating. Um, and I think that one of the things we also need to layer into all of this is that the primary season injects these state specific election rules into this equation. And that in and of itself can generate lines. So whether you have a closed primary, an open primary, a semi 
open closed primary, whether you're going to caucus, you're not going to caucus, some will caucus, some will not, um, any new laws that are coming into play, all of these things need to be factored in and contemplated as we think about um, what's going to happen in the next election cycle. Um, this is kind of the Charles Stewart, Stewart show here. So um, I wanted to share some of my favorite slides, um, which I've um, named the election snow globe. And the reason I do this is that at the top of the screen, you see voters who um, vote on Tuesday election day. On the lower left hand side are voters who have um, opted to vote by mail and on the lower right hand side voters voting um, early in person. And what we see over the course of time as voters are given options in voting, so that's 96, 2000, see if I can get rid of that icon bar there, there we go, okay, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, 2018. What we're seeing here is as voters are given options, I'm going to go back to 18 in a second, but as voters are given options, they are not choosing to vote on Tuesday, election day during the hours of six to six or six to seven or seven to eight or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then what we saw in 2018, even though it was a midterm, we saw a 38% increase nationally from 2004 to 2018. Um, and a shift back towards Tuesday election day. Um, and that tends to happen in midterms where you tend to see a little bit more of a, of a Tuesday election day shift. But we saw quite a dramatic shift uh, last year. And with that increase in, in turnout, the question is, you know, were a lot of these voters first time voters? And if they are um, first time voters, did they vote on Tuesday election day because they weren't aware of what their options are? I raise this because um, this is another kind of um, canary in the coal, line, coal mine slide. This is a slide of extreme enthusiasm for voting. So CNN started this a while back and on the um, left hand side is 600 days out. On the right hand side is zero election day and how many voters said they were extremely enthusiastic about about the election. What's important here is that on election day voters were only at about 38% extremely enthusiastic. The red is circling this year. For 2020 election we already have voters 600, 500, 400 days out surpassing the level of enthusiasm for the election. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us next year as election officials? How do we translate that enthusiasm into effectively cast ballots and ensure that voters, one, know what all their options are, and two, are able to keep the lines moving? Because I will say right now, I think that there will be lines. Um, we, there will be lines because we will have voters coming to vote. Um, I sadly have, have been um, an administrator for a number of elections where we didn't have a single line because we had single digit turnout. So I think we're going to have long lines, but I think we're going to have long lines or lines that are at least moving and the voters are having a good experience because they're being effectively administered to. They're not standing in line and waiting. I think what we really need to change the narrative here that it's the waiting part the long wait is what we don't want to see, but we want to see voters and voters can very easily translate into, um, into lines. Um, so one of the things that I think, um, I know Matt, you've been working a lot with state and local election officials in the last year or two on some things that can help um, in this situation and different policies. Are there one or two things that you think um, you would recommend you know, local and state officials think about um, policies or recommendations that will help with next year? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're getting a little late in the cycle for impact in 2020 on policy issues. But I, I do think that timelines are going to be a, a key issue. I mean, as Tammy's waterfall slides showed, you know, we have a lot more people who are voting by mail, voting early. Um, and it is tough to message to voters what those timelines are. Tammy is obviously very um, involved with voting by mail. You know, there are a lot of state laws out there that don't reflect what postal service standards are okay. in 2020. You know, there are states that require election officials to send out ballots as late as the Monday before election day to, to voters. Those voters are not going to get those absentee ballots yeah. in time. They, are, they 
they're going to see the process as failing them, even though that's required by the law. We need to make sure voters understand those timelines. Um, and in the future, certainly changing those timelines is key. But um, for, for now, being clear, especially when it comes to all these alternative voting methods that um, push people away from, from uh, polling place voting, lighten the load could also help us have fewer uh, people voting on election day, shorter lines. And it just so happens there's a great BPC oh. um, report called The New Reality of Voting by Mail. There is. Um, there is. Um, but there are also some great tools out there um, for jurisdictions and individuals thinking about resource allocation. Um, some of those tools live at the Caltech MIT um, toolkit, which I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. So we have Sorry, new computer here. There we go. Um, so it's at the um, URL that you see there. There are three different um, uh, optimization tools that you can utilize at the Caltech MIT site. Um, we also have, and one of them is this one that you see here, the Graves and Young tool. And that allows you to upload your data, your um, voter registration numbers and, and other pieces of data to um, load them all up at once. And there are great tutorials on how to do it. Another tool is this one, which is the um, Pelzarski tool. I'm going to walk through this one in a minute. Um, these tools, um, a couple of them also reside on the Center for Technology and Civic Life's electiontools.org toolkit. The reason I'm pointing out that they live in a couple of places, including the EAC.gov, is that they're presented, even though the tools are all the same, or are mostly the same in each one. So some of them have one, some have two, some have three, some have all three. Um, the instructions are a little different on each one, so it might give you the opportunity to, um, to go ahead and, uh, and um, allow for you to, to to get some differing um, instruction, which might help in your retention, um, as it were. All of them in order to use, um, for the most part, you need to have um, the estimated turnout. So how many people do you expect to see? How many check-ins do you have? What is your estimated time to check in the voters? So if you're at a vote center or you're at an early voting site and you're using ballot on demand, BOD, you want to also include the time it takes to print up that ballot because you'll need to know that processing time, the number of voting stations, and then also the estimated time it's going to take to vote or to mark that ballot. Um, now, one way to get that is another helpful tool on the CTCL election toolkit, and that's a voting time estimator where you can put in information off of your ballot and it'll provide you with some estimated um, time frames on how long it takes to actually vote it. So when you go back to, say, the Pelzarski tool and you put in some of this information, um, it allows you to get an understanding of what kind of wait time a voter might expect. So you put in the check-ins, the number of voters, the number of stations. If you know that um, you're a Bedouin community and you have a lot of commuters and you get a lot of voting at the beginning of the day or um, at lunchtime, whatever it happens to be, um, you put in that information and if we were to say we estimated we were going to have 800 voters, polls being open from six to seven with two check-ins, and if we thought it took about 90 seconds to check in, average vote time 10 minutes, what would the wait time be? Well, the Pulsarski tool shows us, and this is the yellow, that it would be a seven minute wait. So that's not so bad, but what if something changed? And what if now our processing time to check in was 120 seconds. If we just added half a minute, maybe it's a new ID requirement, maybe it's going back to a paper register instead of electronic register, or some other complication, that factor alone, those 30 seconds, if you have all your provisional voters standing in the same line or all your election day registration all in one line and not separated out, that 30 seconds now takes a seven minute wait to an hour long wait. And that's where we can then know that what do we need to do to bring that wait time down? And that's to add in an additional check-in station. So if we add in three stations, we're now back down to a five minute wait. The tool is really helpful in, I think, in that way because it gives you this kind of visualization that you can take to your boards of supervisors, your city council, your state legislators. It also does that for the second phase of the waiting to vote piece of it. So if you have eight, um, eight machines, eight voting booths, 
you have a wait time of well over an hour. If you have nine, it brings the pink down. 10, it's even further. And we see in this jurisdiction, optimal time is, or optimal numbers would be to have 11. And then no one is waiting for that. There are a couple of other resources I wanted to mention as we wrap up. And that happens to be um, what's listed here, which is the University of Rhode Island's project URI Votes um, has been working with the state of Rhode Island um, for a statewide effort to look at both polling place data um, from electronic poll books, but also from the transactional data of the voting um, systems themselves. So there's information that you can find available on their, on their website for both their booth project and also layout modeling. They have everything is uh, 3D modeling that's to the, um, the size specification and scale. So it gives you the ability to go in, use their model um, from the School of Engineering to help increase the, the flow. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, all of this information um, is available in your election line resources, as well as, as other things. If you go into election line to the resource tab um, for information um, on line allocation and resource allocation. Um, so with that, I think we have a few minutes left for our final Q&A section on what do we expect for 2020? Um, what other resources are available out there? Um, I, of course, also think that anyone interested in data and uh, election administration um, and who are interested in the University of Minnesota um, should take a look at um, class 3982 and 5982, which happen to be data analysis for election administrators um, and taught by yours truly. And we talk about this stuff for a whole semester. So um, with that, do we have any additional questions? We do have a few more. Um, here's one. Has the premise of your calculations formula been compared to real time wait time data, for example, wait times actually collected um, via a card given to someone when they first arrive and then actually the time noted when they um, be begin receiving service? Yeah, so I do think that there have been jurisdictions that have done combinations. So um, there are um, jurisdictions that have participated both by collecting the, the paper, the counting at the top of the hour. Some have decided they want to not do it at the top of every hour, they're gonna do it every 15 minutes or every half hour. Um, so the interval has, has changed a little bit for some, from some of the states. Um, and then also having where, um, you mentioned a card, there's a jurisdiction, I can't remember what, but that uses the teddy bear, they yeah. use, they use Fairfax. stuffed, Fairfax, um, Virginia, they use a stuffed animal that they give to the person in line and they mark down what time it is. And then the person, when they get to the front of the line with you know, the, the stuffed monkey or, um, or teddy bear, whatever it happens to be, um, that's how they kind of keep track of them as they go through the, through the line. Um, so there has been some redundancy in the data collection efforts to make sure that, you know, the, the math behind everything is sound um, and that, that there's consistency there. Yeah, but I haven't, I haven't compared uh, the very few jurisdictions that I know of that have done both. Uh, we just view our, our data collection as far simpler and with, with the one thing they need to, to count really, um, getting better consistent data across jurisdictional lines. Great, thanks. What was your most effective argument in convincing election offices that they should measure lines? Well, I think that for us, what we, what we said to election officials is that lines are likely to happen. And if they do happen and you're not doing anything to study them, to think about how to mitigate them, you don't have a very good story to tell. Um, you know, Again, I don't think every line is evidence of a problem. As Tammy said, there's going to be lines in 2020. That doesn't mean that election officials aren't doing their job. Um, there are also gonna be places where machines break down, poll workers don't plug in half the machines, and so lines end up becoming you know, ridiculous. Being able to just tell your story using the, the data you're collecting um, on election day um, has been our, our most um, persuasive argument for, for most election officials. I think that and also um, knowing when it's happening so that you can address it immediately mm -hmm. um, so that it doesn't continue to snowball and escalate throughout the rest of the day. So understanding if you have a line um, at nine o'clock in the morning is really important that you know that and do everything you can with your backup plans, your um, contingency resources, to try and make sure that we bring that line wait time down 
so that it doesn't just continue to escalate over the course of the day, because those are two very different stories to tell. It's one thing if there's um, a malfunction, uh, something is misprinted, um, a poll list is mistakenly delivered to the wrong polling place. Um, and so there are all sorts of things that can happen because this is a people driven and um, people supported endeavor, this great democracy that we all partake in. And so when things do happen, it's being able to say this has occurred, we resolved the issue with these contingency plans. Um, and because we did so, we were able to um, make sure that, that this was contained and, um, and didn't escalate and that, that fewer voters were, in, as few voters were impacted negatively as possible. Um, if you're not collecting that data, then you, you don't know. And then suddenly you're on the five o'clock news because you have lines where people are waiting for eight and nine hours. So knowing about it and being able to address it and get it taken care of as quickly as possible to make sure your voters are well served is really um, something that, that pretty much every election official I've ever talked to in the last 20 years um, desperately wants to do. The question there also is whether or not they have the tools and resources to be able to react and respond. And maybe the reason that those things are occurring is because they weren't provided with the tools that they asked for at their legislators, legislatures or with their board of supervisors or what have you. Great. Um, how do you calculate in the number of check-in stations? So having one check-in station versus four check-in stations makes the wait time different. Um, I guess by that question, if you're asking how do you determine which one would be the optimal one, I would say um, using the tool to go in and, and put in all of your numbers and then changing it from one, two, three, four, what have you, until you see that the wait time is acceptable. Um, if you're asking what was the background, the, the backing algorithm to the math that supported that, that is not something I am privy to um, or qualified to answer. That's really um, a question for um, Mr. Pelzarski, who developed the tool, and Charles Stewart at MIT. They can, they can explain that mathematical support, but if the question is how do you decide which one you should go with, I would say plug it into the different tools and, um, and see what resources you have available to you and how you can most effectively apply them. So the answer is, is very rarely is it provide the same number of resources to every single polling place in your jurisdiction um, because you will have some supplies sitting there unopened and unused at the end of the day and you will have other precincts that are starved for additional resources. Of course, the data and the, and the findings from, uh, from this data collection can be used to hopefully go back to some legislatures and change some requirements that sometimes limit how um, the resources are allocated, right? I mean, a lot of places have very rigid requirements. And so using data to change policymakers' minds is also helpful. And we do know that, that that has been very effective and successful in states all across the country. I've been told that they've used the resource allocations in order to get additional tabulators, in order to get elect additional electronic poll books or additional voting booths or whatever it happens to be. Great. Last question. Um, are you aware of any resources that jurisdictions can use to help manage the lines outside the polls in the morning? Best practices for managing lines outside, directing traffic, etc. Absolutely. So in the Presidential Commission on Election Administration report, the PCEA, we had a series of recommendations. Um, and so I will say when I moved from Arizona, where I always voted by mail, we had a permanent list to Maryland, where I um, uh, ashamedly always forget to request my ballot by mail. So I end up going and voting in person. Um, there are long lines, but they move quickly. And so one of the things they've done effectively is keep people busy while you're waiting in lines. They had selfie stations. They had um, all sorts of activities that you can do as you're waiting in line. They had um, sample ballots and voting materials to inform you of what was going to be on the ballot, what you needed once you got in the door. And the lines moved very quickly, even though when I pulled into the parking lot, I was aghast and thought, oh my goodness, there's you know, all these people in line, it's going to take forever. I was in and out in less than 20 minutes. And that's really the goal, is for people to show up, to have lines of voters, to have them be processed effectively, and to be happy upon leaving. And that's all the questions. Wonderful. 
Well, thank you all. I think that we have seconds to spare. And so um, I want to thank the University of Minnesota and the Humphrey School for asking us to, um, to chat about this today. And I want to thank Matt for coming over from the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, just like old times, yes. having a chat about, about line data. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all so much.